Praise the Lord. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. What a great morning. What a great opportunity to gather in the Lord's house and to magnify the name of the Lord. Well, let's turn to God's word this morning. Delighted to be with you again in Monaghan. Always look forward to coming and uh, always am blessed each time I come through those doors and hear the praise group already sounding forth and just the Lord's name being magnified. And what a better day to magnify his name than this day, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. We're turning to Acts chapter 2, the Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. I trust that maybe already this morning you've read the gospel account of the resurrection of Christ. And here in Acts chapter 2, we have this great sermon preached on the day of Pentecost by the apostle Peter. And here in the middle of that great message from verse 22, we hear him say, Men of Israel... Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, so as you yourselves also know, him being determined, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. For you have made known to me the ways of life, you will make me full of joy in your presence. And we'll end the reading just there at the end of verse 28. And we focus this morning on verse 23 and verse 24, where again we read, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Those words you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, bring us back just a couple of days ago, of course, to Good Friday, where, as you'll see at the center of this great Pentecostal message of Peter's, the cross and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the focus. The cross is central to an understanding of the entire scriptures. It's foreshadowed in the Old Testament in all the systems of offerings and sacrifices that were established under the covenant with Moses, the burnt offerings, the peace offerings, sin offerings and guilt offerings, together with the various animal sacrifices, all emphasize the concepts of substitution, atonement, and reconciliation with God. And of course, when we move from the law into the prophets, we see the prophets pointing also 
to the coming of the servant of the Lord, who would suffer, who would die, and who, praise again, praise God, would rise again from the dead. The Messiah is depicted in, for example, that well-known chapter of Scripture, Isaiah 53, as the sinner's substitute, as the one who suffered for the sinner and on behalf of the sinner and in the place of the sinner, that indeed he might be the sinner's Savior. And when we come into the New Testament, the Gospels are not simply biographies, but they are the accounts, the accounts of all that lead to the death and the resurrection of Christ. Go into the epistles and they proclaim Jesus Christ and him crucified. They declare one who lived and was dead and praise God is alive again. Peter at first tells us that the Jews with their wicked hands nailed Christ to the cross. He goes on in chapter 4 also to show that it was the Romans with their wicked hands who took Christ and nailed him to the cross. And later on in Acts chapter 4, he shows indeed that the responsibility for Christ hanging on that cross is the responsibility of all mankind, you and me included. But of course, he also goes on to show, as indeed the scriptures show, that the ultimate responsibility for the death of Christ upon that cross is that of God himself. As we read here in the middle of this great Pentecost Day sermon, that it was by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God. And if we go back into Isaiah 53, we read it, pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. That's not to say that God took pleasure in the sufferings and in the death of his son. But God took pleasure in the outcome. And the outcome of it all is this, that bless God, the sin question, the sin problem, the sin that touches your life and my life, the sin that is common to us all, the sin that brings us under the condemnation of a holy God. That sin question has been settled once and for all. Hallelujah for the cross. It was settled as we see in eternity. That's what's meant by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. It brings us back even before the foundations of this earth were led where God in his foreknowledge saw the plight of man in his sin and in those counsels of eternity God devised a plan. And that's the redemption plan that runs through this entire Bible from Genesis right through to Revelation like a scarlet cord. You trace this great plan of God, that Christ's blood would be shed, that Christ would stand in our stead as our sacrifice, and blessed be the name of the Lord. That settled it. That settled it all. That settled the sin problem. We read, for example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Verse 21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. God 
in him. God devised the plan. God saw that plan in the person of his son, finalized upon that cross and sealed by his mighty resurrection. And as one of our older hymns tells us, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy, there was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. And Calvary is the place to come, dear friend, this morning. If you're not yet forgiven, if you're not yet pardoned, if you're not yet saved, Calvary is the place to come. You don't need to get on a plane at Dublin airport and head off to Tel Aviv in Israel. You simply need to bow your head. You simply need to bow your will. You need to bow yourself before God today and say, Calvary covers it all. Come, Lord, cleanse me in your blood. Come, Lord, forgive my sin. Come, Lord, blot out the record against me. Come and save my soul and bless God. You will know the benefit. You will know, dear friend, the blessing. You will know the power of sins forgiven and of Christ the risen Lord entering your life. And so we read about that cross where delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, Jesus was crucified and put to death. But look what follows immediately in this great sermon of Peter's. Verse 24 of Acts 2, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. As Peter expands the cross, now he expands the resurrection. And in these words of the Apostle Peter, we have a number of suggestions. And the first suggestion is this, that there is an invader. There is an invader. I'll come back to that in a moment. And the second thing is this, that there is an impossibility. There's an impossibility. And what is that impossibility? Well, Peter spells it out for us. It is that it was not possible that Jesus should be held by death. It was not possible that Jesus should be held by death. And as we see the invader and we see the impossibility, we see also a great implication. And this great implication is simply this, that just as death could not hold Jesus, so, bless God, death cannot hold those whose trust is in him. God has declared it that Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection seals my pardon and seals my resurrection to eternal and everlasting life. Glory be to God. Let's think about the invader. You'll notice in the text that, that Peter speaks about the pains of death. He speaks of Jesus having been raised up by God, having loosed the pains of death. Having loosed the pains of death. Now notice that it is not the pains of Christ. Christ suffered pain. The pains of Christ were real. The pains of Christ were intense. 
Indeed, the pains of Christ were excruciating as he bore our sin and curse and penalty upon that cruel Roman cross. You just think of some of the pains that Jesus bore even on the way to the cross. He bore the pain of our grief, our sorrow, our burdens, and our sins. He bore emotional and social suffering, the pain, as we saw in 2 Corinthians, the pain of being made sin for us. And at the cross, there was the isolation from the Father and the sheer weight of our sin and its guilt that necessitated him taking in in Gethsemane the, the, the cup of God's wrath and drinking it at the cross to the very dregs. Pain so intense that blood flowed from his forehead as the very blood vessels in his head burst through pressure. You think of that crucifixion day, the pain of the scourge, that cat of nine tails with leather thongs at each end, lacerating the back and body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You think of that crown of nails that was specially manufactured by the soldiers for his head, piercing his brow. You think of the nails through his hands and through his feet. You think of the excruciation of crucifixion, which was the Roman method of execution for the vilest of offenders, those who were found guilty of heinous crimes such as murder and robbery and violence. It was the cruelest and wickedest method of execution that was ever invented. Even a Roman historian described it as the most cruel and disgusting punishment imaginable. It was designed to delay death until the maximum suffering and torture had been inflicted on the victim. Sometimes people suffered for days before death came. The sufferings, yes, of Jesus on that cross at Calvary were real. They were intensive. They were extensive. But it is not the pains of death, the pains of Christ, that Peter is addressing in this part of our text. He is addressing quite clearly the pains of death itself. It is as if death experienced pain and suffering. And this depicts death in rather personal terms. We see Jesus the sufferer, but we also see death (coughs) as the sufferer. What happened to Christ on the cross? Well, he suffered death. But what happened to death in the tomb? It suffered death. Glory be to God. When Jesus was loosed, when death was loosed from the pains of death. This depicts, as I say, death in rather personal terms. And we tend to speak of death as uh, in rather personal terms, as if death were a person that comes to us. The grim reaper we use as an analogy to the, 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 the process of death. And in the scriptures, death almost, in the scriptures we see death almost portrayed in personal terms like this. Death, for example, is an invader. We said we'd come back to it, and here we are. Death is an invader. 
because we, we read that death was never in the original plan for mankind. Death came as a, a consequence of sin. Death is an intruder. Just as an infection invades the body, so death has invaded this world of mankind. And like an infection has passed to and spread to all men. And the scriptures bear this out in, for example, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, where we read that just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. Death the invader. And we read also there in Romans chapter 5 that death is depicted almost like a king. A king. Again, a personal term. For we read in Romans 5 and verse 14 how death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. And then in verse 17 of Romans 5, we read that as by the one man's offense, death reigned, reigned like a king over us. We read too in Romans 5 and 21, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death the King. Paul speaks about it reigning. Reigning as a tyrant who rules by fear. And then, of course, in the Scriptures, we read of death as an enemy. And again, a very personal term. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that great resurrection exposition by the Apostle Paul, in verse 26 says, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And all of these references present death in personal terms as Peter does in his reference to death experiencing pain. And what was death's pain? Well, death's pain was this. It tried to hold Christ. It tried to hold Christ. And it suffered pain as it tried to hold Christ. It went to great pains to hold him. It put up a fight to hold him. It struggled to hold him. It wrestled to hold him. Death experienced pain in that it tried to keep Jesus dead. But it is impossible for the pains of hell, for the pains of death to hold him. And we read if you look in the, if you have a margin Bible or a reference Bible, that word pains there in the middle of Acts chapter 2 and verse 24 may also be rendered like this, that the birth pangs or the birth pains of death was not able to hold Christ. There again we see death in personal terms. It is like a mother who is about to give birth, but does not want to give birth, and is struggling, and going to great lengths and pains to keep that baby contained within her womb. And the more she struggles, the more pain she experiences. And so you have this, this picture of death trying to hold Christ. Christ is bursting forth. Christ is rising, Christ is being raised, and death is trying hopelessly, in vain, to hold him. 
and experiencing great pain as it does so, but glory be to God, death cannot keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, and up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor o'er the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death couldn't keep him. That's the impossibility. It was impossible that death should hold Christ because of who he is, the person he is. He's the son of God. He's the creator of this world. He's the prophet. He's the priest. He's the king. He's King Jesus. Death may have fancied himself as a king, but he was no match for King Jesus. And here at the cross, here at the tomb, you see this, this great conflict. You see this great battle. You see this great contest. King Death versus King Jesus. And bless God, King Death is no match for King Jesus. It's finished. The battle, thank God, is over. And Christ is risen from the dead. You'll remember that Jesus, speaking of his body, says, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, My Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. You see who was in control on Good Friday? Jesus was in control on Good Friday. You see who's in control on Easter Saturday? Jesus is in control on Easter Saturday. You see who's in control on Easter Sunday? Glory be to God, Jesus is in control. And King Death must bow to him. It was impossible. It was impossible for death to hold Christ. You try putting a charge of 100,000 volts into a 240 volt uh, light bulb, and that light bulb will have no chance whatsoever. It will disintegrate. It will smash in a hundred pieces. It will be splattered all over the place death couldn't hold Jesus. Jesus had come with this purpose. It was to redeem. It was to save. It was to bring life, life more abundantly. It was that we might have life and have it eternally. And the implication, of course, of all of this is that if death and its cords could not keep Christ, then neither can it keep those who belong to him. An old poem says, O oh, death, be not proud. Though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Death is defeated. Jesus lives and Jesus is Lord. 
just as Pharaoh couldn't keep Israel or any part of it. Even when he eventually conceded that Israel could go, he said to them, go and serve your God. Only let your flocks and your herds be kept back. Exodus chapter 10. But Moses said, our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof will be left behind. Pharaoh couldn't keep Israel, and death couldn't keep Jesus. Neither will death keep you and me. You'll remember the encouragement Jesus gave to Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus, at Lazarus' own graveside, that he's the resurrection, and he's the life. And he that believeth on him shall never die. We as Christians, bless God, are transferred to heaven. Just as Herod couldn't keep Peter. You'll remember he had arrested Peter having executed John. And you'll remember that that Peter was kept in an inner prison. And he was kept in chains and in stocks. And there were doors locked. And yet God sent the angel of the Lord. And that angel came and opened those prison doors and loosed those manacles that bound Peter and led him safely out of the prison to where the church was meeting in prayer. And the church were somewhat unbelieving when Peter... (laughs) eventually arrived, but Herod couldn't keep Peter. And death cannot keep you nor me. Jesus Christ has proved himself over and over to be Lord of disease, to be Lord over demons, to be Lord over all kinds of dangers. And we see that through every page of all four Gospels and continued indeed throughout the Acts of the Apostles. And he is Lord, bless God of death, Lord over death. And thank God today he is Lord over every dilemma. And whatever situation may be confronting you on this Easter Sunday morning, 20. 23, Jesus Christ has proved himself to be Lord. He is able. He cares. And bless God, he's willing. And no matter what your dilemma may be, no matter what your trial may be, no matter, dear friend, this morning, what may confront you, whatever its proportions, and however great its threats, thank God today, Jesus is Lord. He is Lord over disease. He is Lord over demons. He is Lord over danger. He is Lord over death. And he is Lord over every dilemma. Bless God this morning that he is not here. He is risen. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to each and every heart.